So I will be presenting today on the Astra Center for the study in, of and treatment of depressive disorders. In general, for the Astra Center, it targets depressive disorders um, broadly, but we do a lot of work in perinatal mental health. So our focus is really getting at how to optimize treatment for mothers dealing with perinatal depression and um, depression throughout their reproductive years. So Dr. Catherine Wisner is actually the director of the Astra Center, and she's taken on the um, task of making the Astra Center a prominent research um, facility and clinical practice to try to treat depression, and also to develop cutting edge research that will focus on um, breakthroughs into how to optimize treatment for depressive disorders. So within the Astra Center, we have three main areas of focus. Um, treatment research is our main focus, and that includes um, working with obstetrics and pharmacology, and that's with getting at um, medication dosing and optimizing the levels, including some work on smoking sensation, um, finishing smoking during pregnancy to prevent um, some of the negative effects they have on the infant. Um, within psychotherapy, we mainly focus on behavioral therapies, and that includes um, behavioral therapies that are like um, behavioral activation and mindfulness-based therapies in order to target depression. But also, I do a lot of work on mother-fathers, seeing how both their depression plays into parenting behaviors and then in turn how that affects the infant. For the basic sciences, they look at the biology um, of um, rats and also of human beings to see how they can develop behavioral models to better um, assess depression, but also provide better treatments that can target specific mechanisms that plays into depression. And then we have a statistics team that helps with all of our work, but they specialize in clinical trials. For training, um, both of our fields, so in psychiatry and psychology, there's not much training in perinatal mental health. So we do a lot of training with fellows and residents to try to get them to um, understand the importance of women's health in general, but also perinatal health, and to train them of how to implement treatments within our specialty areas. And actually next week, we're having the perinatal mental health conference um, that's going to be people from internationally and nationally to come in to um, talk about the research and also the, uh, the best treatments that's um, been produced over the past year so that we can you know, basically come together to talk about this topic. And then finally, clinically, we have the Arkes um, Clinic. And so you know, a lot of our research, of course, influences our clinic work, but a lot of the questions we have within our research is based on tough um, situations we have with patients uh, figure out how to optimize treatment, so we try to um, let that influence our research topics. Because we focus on um, women's mental, uh, mental health, we have to do a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration. We work with obsessive gynecology, neurology, pharmacology, pediatrics, pulmo pulmonology, but even anthropology in order to um, influence the type of work we're doing and to get an idea of the complex um, mechanisms that are going on within a mother at, during this time. So the Astra Center really embodies the idea of a, uh, the model of translational research. Like I said, we have basic research that influences the patient-oriented research, and that in turn influences our um, population-based research. So today I'm going to present um, a couple of studies on each of the topics and different faculty. Um, of course, I can't go through all the studies going on or all the faculty who was involved with the Astra Center, but I at least want to present some of the highlights. So first, starting off with the basic research. Um, Eva Rade, Dr. Eva Rade, is really targeting an important question of how to diagnose depression. As a clinician, we have difficulty sometimes getting uh, accurate diagnosis even just based on the subjective report, people you would think they would know what they're feeling, but a lot of times we have either a lack of insight or other cultural influences that impacts how they report their depression. In addition, there's plenty of research that shows that clinicians also have a bias in the way they interpret a, a patient's symptoms, which also would influence the final diagnosis. So what she developed and has got a lot of publicity for is the, a blood-based depression testing. And what she found that there was nine RNA blood marker levels that differentiate individuals with depression versus those who are non-depressed, and three RNA blood marker levels that indicate a depression vulnerability. And so you can see that this will have um, strong clinical utility. Um, hopefully in the future, this will give us an opportunity to identify those susceptible to depression prior to the onset. And I, I'm sure you can understand from any um, disease perspective, to be able to catch and predict it early on would give you an opportunity to treat earlier and monitor 
the symptoms to make sure that the person wouldn't have a full-fledged onset if at all possible. In addition, it gives us the opportunity to predict who will be responsive to treatment. In the future, hopefully we can do some studies to understand what types of treatment to use and who will be responsive rather than having to go through different trials, either the medication or therapy, but be able to use this testing in order to um, inform some of the treatment um, plans that we develop. And then finally, it'll give us an objective assessment of remission in response to treatment. For Jelena Radulovic, She's working on trying to understand how do stress-related memories induce anxiety and depression. And this is pretty interesting because especially as a psychologist, when we deal with people who have developmental um, or had negative experiences during their development and throughout their life, it would be great to understand how that influences their risk and their development of these anxiety and depressive disorders. But she works with rat models, look, um, behavioral models, to say for mice, um, to perform analyses of the molecular, cellular, and circuit levels of what influences the risk for depression. So her goal is to understand the mechanisms linking anxiety and depression to stressful situations and experiences, and then also identify treatment targets for stress-related disorders evolving abnormal regulation of their affect. So I'll highlight a couple of her studies. The first looked at the um, hippocampal circuit, and she found two things. One is that the hippocampal cortical circuits contribute to the formation and retrieval of stress-related memories that affect mood and fear. And then even more, the subconscious, that the hippocampal subcortical circuits actually contribute to the formation of um, inaccessible memories that actually affect your social and affective behavior. So this is kind of getting at some of the models that already existed, that there are unconscious thoughts and um, memories that, are, that exist and can actually affect your mood, even though it's not necessarily um, on the forefront of your mind. So for regarding treatment, she was looking at a way to optimize antidepressant usage. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but anxiety and depression are comorbid. They go hand in hand, a lot of times co-occur, and therefore it can be sometimes difficult even for providing medications of how to target. And specifically, the rapid acting antidepressants um, through the NMDA receptors actually can start to worsen the anxiety symptoms, even though they're, they're treating the depressive symptoms. So her goal was to find a way to target specific NMDA receptors to, that were specific to mood, rather than for them to be affecting and worsening the anxiety symptoms. And you can see how that would be effective for treatment. Looking at patient-oriented research, we have Dr. Catherine Wisner, and she's dedicated her life's work to perinatal mental health research and treatment. Um, so I'm going to highlight some of her more recent research to um, show kind of the direction she's going even for the future research right now. So one of the studies she looked at was the onset of depression identified in the postpartum. And it's important to label it that way because a lot of times people just use the term postpartum depression, but it's actually been misused so much because technically it should start within one month postpartum during that time, not necessarily that it started prior. So the goal is to understand how can we break apart depression identified in the postpartum, but figure out what's the real onset of that depression. So depression can start prior to even being pregnant, during pregnancy, or in the postpartum period. And the studies show that there's different risk factors that played into um, the, when the onset of depression occurred. And so the more protective factors you had, the more likely it would start in the postpartum period, whereas if you had uh, more risk factors, you're likely to start either during pregnancy or prior to pregnancy, showing the chronicity of the depression. But this is also the case for bipolar disorder, showing that women who are identified with depression in the postpartum may actually have bipolar disorder, and it's more likely to start prior to pregnancy. With bipolar disorder, you're more likely to um, be sensitive to stress and also to different changes in your rhythms, such as social rhythms and even um, sleep. So that puts a woman more at risk for developing depression early on. Um, and then when looking at why does that even matter, the earlier that the depression started, the more likely that the mother would have um, increased weight gain during the postpartum period, sleep disturbance, and also psychotic symptoms showing a, a heightened severity of the postpartum depression. Next, she looked at the trajectory of depression identified in the postpartum. And so it was a sample of 618 women and what we did was use statistical analyses to break apart was, were there separate trajectories of how depression just naturally occurred and um, the chronicity of it over 12 months postpartum. 
what we found was that the first group you see at the bottom is that they had um, a remission of depression early on. So these are the women who naturally start to get better after that first stressful period and start to, um, and depression stays in remission. But you see for the second and third group, they started around the same place where their depression is more severe, but one group started to improve and it was getting to partial remission, but the other group actually worsened over time and sustained that worsening of their symptoms. Which, and this is the 6.8% that we are most worried about because of those that, who are most at risk, especially if they're not receiving treatment early on. And what we're able to do is look at the different characteristics of these women to see how to even predict which trajectory they would fall in. And so that included things like age, race, marital status, education, parity, childhood and adult chi um, physical and sexual abuse, the number of chronic illnesses, comor having a comorbid anxiety disorder, and global functioning. And we use some of these factors to be able to create an equation to actually predict which um, trajectory the mother would fall in with about a 70% accuracy. And this shows that we can actually hopefully in the future use the characteristics of the mom to know how do we develop maybe step care programs or early intervention to prevent the mothers getting to that level of severity in the postpartum period. So why is that even important? Why did, knowing the trajectory, why is that important? First of all, it affects your functioning. Not just the suffering that the mothers go through when they're depressed, but the fact that their global functioning is decreased when they're not being treated. Women who had SSRI treatment, she found, actually had improved um, global functioning, which would obviously relate to parenting behaviors, the family environment, and whatnot for how the mother's able to engage in her life and even get back to her normal life after the um, pregnancy or after delivery. But there's a problem. With antidepressants, it's difficult at times to actually get the optimal dosing. Women during the second trimester have an increased metabolism of the medication, which need, means that they need 1.3 to two times the level of medication in order to get the proper levels in their system. And so she found this in a smaller study. And just this year, she was recently awarded a center grant by NICHD to do this on a large scale. And so it's called the Optimizing Medication Management for Mothers with Depression, we call it Optimom. And it's a way to basically figure out how to optimize the SSRI levels and metabolite concentrations and to be able to understand their trajectory in relation to depressive anxiety symptoms. So it's an observational study that she's doing. And we're going to look at the genomic variability of inter individual differences in SSRI dosing, plasma concentrations, and pharmacodynamics. In addition, especially given that's NICHD, we're also looking at how does that affect the fetus and um, the infant long term. So she's going to examine the maternal fetal plasma concentrations and the pharmacogenetic characteristics associated with the neonatal SSRI absence syndrome. And currently, she's actually recruiting for the study because it's, it's um, in the process of get, um, going through the IRB. Next, we're looking at something pretty similar by Dr. Crystal Clark. She's looking, though, at bipolar disorder, which is also not uncommon during the postpartum period. And so her goal is similar, is to optimize the medication treatment for women who are pregnant with bipolar disorder. And she's looking at longitudinal studies during pregnancy and the postpartum to inform therapeutic dose monitoring and establish dosing algorithms. And then from there, she also wants to understand how, what's the impact on the infant and what's the risk benefit for the infant and for the fetus. So she conducted the first ever study looking at lamotrigine in, in postpartum women with bipolar disorder. And what she found was that the changes in the concentration patterns was similar to epilepsy. So just a little bit of history behind it, within um, neurology, lamotrigine has been used and is FDA approved, but more recently it's been approved for lamotrigine um, for bipolar women. But within psychiatry, it's been difficult sometimes for clinicians always to feel comfortable using it because they're concerned about the risks. But this is pretty problematic. For one, it's already been proven that it can be, the doses can be changed um, with women who have epilepsy, and also the fact that the concentration levels do decrease in pregnancy for bipolar women, and that leads to a worsening of symptoms. And especially for bipolar disorder, those type of symptoms can put the mother and the infant at risk if they're not properly treated. So actually under-treating them puts them at more risk. So her next step is to start to look at mood stabilizers more broadly, including lithium, quetiapine, and lorazodone, and looking at the same things. What is the uh, effects of pregnancy on the metabolism 
efficacy and serum concentrations of the medication, and also develop dosing algorithms during pregnancy. And then she also wants to understand how does that impact the fetus and the mother's metabolism through different genetic influences that might play a part. And then finally, T3 is the population-based research. So at the ASHRAE Center, we have what we call the ASHRAE Registry, and we're looking at um, women who have um, reproductive-related mood and anxiety disorders to see how they respond to treatment just within our clinic. So we want to understand how does just natural, in a natural setting for um, treatment, how does that relate to their um, depression levels or anxiety levels? And especially looking at the um, relapse of the symptoms or remission. And then we also include women who have um, chronic illnesses so we can get see how does that impact their um, response to treatment over time. For the study, it's basically every three months we collect clinician-rated and self-report mental health and biopsychosocial background in order to understand what the trajectory of the symptoms are, are over time. And then we also bank serum samples for biomarkers so that we can later assess the treatment-resistant and hormonally vulnerable mood and anxiety disorders and predict their, um, their response to treatment to medication based on some of these um, biomarkers. Women also have the option of providing RNA and DNA so that we can later um, look at the me metabolic genotypes that may aid in the individualizing dosing of medication for these women. Um, because I focus on perinatal health in general, including women, but do a subspecialty in fathers, most recently we started actually including fathers to look at some of the gender-specific aspects of that. So we have, I have a father's mental health specialty clinic. So we're starting to include the fathers because they do experience depressions a lot of times differently, where they start to have not only some of the traditional symptoms, but they're not as likely to report, but also some behaviors that are linked to depression, such as externalizing behaviors and other um, misbehavior. And so we can look at some of the gender-specific um, differences between the mothers and fathers during the perinatal period when both the mothers and fathers are at risk, but of course that women are at a higher risk during this time. Thank you.